Okay, so if you want to open up Vasari as a modeling environment, or I'm also going to open up Revit, just so I can have them both open and kind of show you where they are the same and where they are different. Because really, all Vasari is, is it's the conceptual modeling within Revit, kind of exported and kind of put into a separate package. But really, the same sort of tools in terms of being able to kind of take basic shapes and start forming masses just by... And the, the, the way the basic mechanism works is it always starts by just sort of putting together some profiles, just sort of tracing some profiles, and then either extruding or blending or sweeping, or there's a number of things you can do to them to kind of make the shapes you want. Okay, let's let that finish opening. I'll show you how we can both get to the same place. Okay, pop, pop, pop. Okay, here comes Revit. I'm going to open up a new project there. Almost with you. Okay, how are you? Most of you, sorry. Okay, not good. Let's go ahead and open up a new project. We'll get ourselves started. Looks like it's still spinning in. Roll. Log it in. I see some rhino coming up over there. Okay. <laughs> and it says these are all opening up as you comment. All the software is available kind of here in the lab, but it's also available if you want to download any of the stuff and put it on your own machines. Go to students.autodesk.com, and it's all just available for free to you. So go ahead and download whatever you like. Vasari's in a slightly different place. It's in like, oh, they have their own Vasari lab site. Just type in Vasari download into Google. It'll take you to the site where you can actually download that file. Okay, and let's just kind of walk you through in terms of where the different things are. If I open up Vasari, if some of you are looking at that environment, let me kind of take a look at that. It's over here. You're looking at this basic modeling environment. We're looking at a 3D view that has a work plane, has some different levels on it, the project browser, and the properties over here. And this environment is actually the same one that people who are in Revit will find if you go to New. Okay. And here's the main project environment environment. This is the place where we tend to put real building elements, walls, doors, windows, things like that. If you want to go through and create conceptual masses, what we do in Vasari, what you do is you flip over to the Massing and Site tab, and you say an in-place mass, and you'll basically get to the same editing environment. Okay. We could also do this as a separate tool, but it's going to work pretty much the same way. It's going to warn us a little bit. Generally, masses in Revit are invisible to us because they're really more forms that we stretch building items to. So it tries to keep them invisible, just as kind of like construction elements. But we'll go ahead and make them visible since we're going to be working with them here. Okay, and we'll give it a name. You know, let's like call it mass one. That's fine. Okay. And now, the tools that are available up here are actually sort of very, very similar to the tools that are available in Vasari. In Vasari, if I say create mass, it's kind of the same thing. So we have these basic drawing tools. Ultimately, we can do a lot of different things, but we finish the mass to create the mass. And I'll just flip back to Revit. I'll apologize, this is a little bit confusing. I just want to kind of show you the parallelism. It's the same basic drawing tools, and ultimately, you finish the mass to create it. So it's really it's just the same environment. Okay, so in whichever environment you want to work with, let's think about how you can kind of create your basic masses. And the idea really starts, okay, we're going to come up with sort of very simple surfaces to say the overall form, and then we'll start thinking about the features, like where the openings are relative, kind of solid surfaces, and kind of, oh, if there's sloped surfaces we want to articulate, things like that. So I'll do it over in Vasari for now. It tends to start with going ahead and just drawing things. So either drawing kind of rectangular shapes like this, Okay. And when you draw a shape like that, a closed shape, it'll actually form a surface in the closed loop. I can then start pulling up, kind of in a very SketchUp-like way to form something like that. Okay. Another way you can go ahead and create these sort of surfaces is more like if you have something, oh, kind of that has a straight back to it but has a curving, undulating front or something like that, I can go through and you know, use a spline or something along one of the edges. And let me go ahead and close that up. I remember which is the actual line, that one right there. There we go. Okay, and now I can go ahead and um, extrude that thing up too. 
But really, it all starts with just creating different profiles, different profiles of shapes, and kind of pushing and pulling around and kind of seeing what you can do. So once you start creating these basic shapes, these things uh, can be pushed and pulled. Okay, just to kind of understand them that way. They also have all sorts of numeric values to them. So, for example, if you click on a surface, you can sort of see what the dimension is on the side. So if you know that your building is going to be 30 feet tall or something like that, go ahead and do something like that. Same thing over here. We can go ahead and push and pull on the front of it. Say that's going to be 40 feet deep. Whatever it is you have in mind. Okay, so we can go ahead and push and pull on the different surfaces. That kind of works out okay. This will allow us to push and pull on pretty nicely, although it's going to sort of stretch the whole thing. That surface is a little bit weirder in terms of pushing and pulling and what's going to really happen to it. So in this case, it looks like we're shearing the whole thing. That's a little bit harder to control in terms of what's going on. So we can push and pull on the surfaces. We can also go ahead and push and pull on edges. So for example, if I wanted to create more of a kind of a sloping roof condition, I can like just pull that up. Okay, and the real key when you're working well as mass modeling is to try and think, you know, in what order, if you're really working with like a big block of clay and you have to sort of push and pull and kind of add edges to it and kind of think about continuing to deform it, is the order of operations that'll sort of get you to what you want kind of in the least number of steps or most efficiently. So for example, this little building that I have a little uh, kind of sloping roof on it right now, if I wanted to put a little L off to the side or sort of extend part of it or something like that, you can go ahead and kind of keep on doing things where in a very SketchUp-like way, for example, I can sketch on the surface. I either can sketch on the work plane or on a surface. But I can go ahead and like do things like, let me uh, just kind of, I'll complete something over there. Okay, And then that'll create a surface for us where we can sort of uh, pull on and out and kind of make more of an extension to it. Okay, so the, the, the big trick within these sorts of tools is really just trying to figure out what order of operations to go ahead and make that happen, to kind of uh, give you the shape you want. So these same sort of things, it's going to work just as well. I'll switch over to Revit just for the, the benefit of the folks who are working over in that environment. I'm in the massing environment there. Again, oh, I'm sort of in a uh, plan view right now. I can switch that over to a 3D view, but I can do that. In Revit, it doesn't actually create the forms automatically. I do have to go through and say, create a solid form, but it has the same effect. Let me switch it over to 3D so you can sort of see it there. Oops. I'm confusing myself in terms of I got two title bars that are looking about the same right on top of each other. So I'll switch that over here. And again, that same pushing and pulling is going to work. And I'll make that 30 feet tall also. Now, for your form making, there are a couple of other kind of really cool things you can do, because just extruding works pretty well. You know, most people are pretty happy with extruding in terms of making things happen. You can start getting to more complex shapes, too. So, for example, if you want to blend two shapes together or evolve a shape or something like that, it's you know, also available here. Okay, so do it here, doing it in a different environment. If you want to go through and uh, kind of do that sort of an operation either in Vasari or in Revit, it basically looks like this. Okay. Extrusion always happens if you have a single profile and you say make a surface out of it, it'll understand that you either want me to do one of two things. You'll either say, I want to make a single surface or I want to make an extrusion. Okay, and if there's some ambiguity about what to do, it'll ask. It'll sort of suggest to you, hey, do you want A or do you want B? If you want to go through and do something like a blend or something like that, just to kind of give you a more complex form to work with, what you can do is as follows. Let me go down to level one, okay, one level. I'll go through and draw like a box down there. I'm going to go up to level two. I'm going to draw something else that's just offset from it. Just some sort of a different shape that's going to make me blend between the two different profiles. Okay, I'm going to switch back over to 3D just so you can see those both. Okay, it's a little bit hard to see what's going on there, but there's one above the other. Okay, if I now take that one and I control click to get the other one, and say create a form out of them, okay, it'll do the blend between the two of them. Okay, and once you've gone ahead and created that blend, no worries, we can still take the profiles and start tweaking and deforming and whatever it is we want to do to it. But just really sort of generate it in whatever way is the most comfortable and the kind of going to get you to what you want. And sometimes, be aware of this, sometimes the easiest thing is to go through and actually you know, add and subtract. 
So you can use positive and uh, negative. We can do void forms too. So for example, if I want to go through and basically cut out the corner of this building, let's see if I can actually get something to draw down there. What I want to try to do is actually draw down, and sometimes in 3D I have to be very careful to pick what the placement plane is, really just what I'm drawing on. I'm going to go down to level one as opposed to sort of uh, getting it some other way. I'll basically draw some sort of a cylinder. I'm going to, for this thing, choose it, but say instead of a solid form, create a void form out of it. Okay, And then it'll basically uh, create something that'll take away the mass instead. And then we can start manipulating all those things. And there's just a lot of tricks to all this stuff in terms of the basic mass manipulation. But really, what I want you to do is just think pretty freely about how it is you're going to go ahead and create your forms. In fact, let me see if I can bring one in. I was working with someone yesterday who actually was just wanting to play around with uh, bringing in something from Rhino. Okay, and uh, could we do that? So he created something in Rhino. Let me see if I even still have it on the machine. Let me pop back out here. Uh, where's my Rhino? I'll figure out. <laughs> Looks like Rhino wants some attention. Let me go ahead and close that up here. Let me see if I can open the most recent one, see if it's still in here. Well, it looks like I don't have it saved right in here. Let me just bring in what he did do. But basically the issue is if you're going to go through and create something in Rhino, the key is what I really want to get out of it is the surfaces. Okay, so if you've done an incredibly detailed design already and you already have double wall surfaces and you've cut all sorts of interesting things into it, you know, what we really want to try and transfer across is just, it's really the forms, the outer surfaces. So sometimes it's better to sort of just take a few things, make a mesh out of a few things, bring them across, they're going to determine the essential shape. And then, you know, we can even kind of have the openings in the surfaces and stuff like that. But the key is typically to bring it in as less detail. Okay, just kind of bring the main surfaces across because then we can work with them kind of over in the other environment and make true uh, multi-dimensional wall surfaces and assign materials kind of on the Revit side. So let me show you, let's see if I can kind of open up what he had created. Um, here we are. Let me go ahead and just finish those masses up. I'll bring in sort of what he had created. In Revit or in Visari, it's going to work the same way. You can say insert and link to a CAD file. Okay, and from uh, Rhino, if you're coming that way, the format that is really the best one to take it over is, is an SAT file. Okay, so if you bring things out as an SAT file, we can grab them over on this side. Let me see if I can find the one we were looking at playing around yesterday. I got some old ones there. I think it's an, oh, there's my DWG, so let me go to the SATs. There we go. So I got some basic forms in here. This was a building he was working on. Let me I'll bring it in here. Sometimes with Rhino, you have to be careful about just whether or not it's going to detect the units. I'm going to go ahead and set the units to feet just to go and make sure it's to the proper scale. But I will bring in his building. It's linking to it. It's going to go dropping it in there. Let's see what happened. Is it there? There it is. OK, it's this guy right here. So. That was a form that got created in Rhino. Let's see if I can move that thing around. Oh, that's interesting. I have to do it in a plan view or something like that. Here's the deal, though, about Rhino surface. And let me kind of give you such a general clue about kind of bringing things over from Rhino. The deal is, these surfaces that I sort of create in Vasari and Revit, the nice thing is I can actually grab the individual surfaces and do my pushing and pulling and kind of play with them the way you'd sort of like to. You know, this Rhino thing that I brought in here, check it out. It's kind of sitting there in like a big blue invisible box. It's like one big old thing so you can kind of look but can't touch. Okay, and that's not very useful to you in terms of what you want to do here. So what you want to do is if you bring something in from Rhino as a starting point is actually kind of bring it in in a special way. There's this thing about masses, conceptual masses, and we've been creating those. Okay? When you bring in the Rhino object by default, it's not in a conceptual mass. It's just a bunch of geometry. And the trick is you can't explode it. You want to be able to explode that and do something to it, but it doesn't do anything that's useful to you. What you can do, though, is this. 
If you go through and, and here's the trick to working with Rhino, go ahead and say make a mass. Okay, just make a big empty mass. Okay, and then we can go ahead and bring your Rhino into that. Let's see if I can find it in here. Where did it go? Did I put it in the same place. Let me try that again. Did I say the yes to that? I shall make it much bigger so I can sort of see it. Do I have to drag it in since I already did it there? Let me try this. Where is that thing that's a mouth? Hang on, it's a linked CAD thing. I'm thinking about where it is right now because I brought it in separate. It's just not showing up to me right now. Mm -hmm. I try bringing in the other one. Okay, there's a second one. The other one might have been right on top of the first one, that's why I wasn't seeing it. I will finish that mess. Okay, here's the deal. As a something that got brought in as a mass, okay, all of a sudden now it does have surfaces. I can go ahead and do it, you know, like uh, work with it kind of the way I want to. I still can't push and pull, but those surfaces are now understood as being different surfaces that I can then take over to uh, Ecotech and use as shading surfaces or as clear surfaces or as wall surfaces. So the big difference is the Rhino object all by itself and the big shoe box that won't let you touch anything, you know, we can't really use those surfaces. But if you bring things in as a conceptual mass and pour it into there, as soon as you say close the conceptual mass, it does a big shrink wrap all the way around it. Okay, and really just uses that geometry to then create mass surfaces, which then can be used you know, for the, the shading analysis and the daylighting analysis. So that's the key to working with Rhino. But again, kind of keep it simple in terms of what you're doing as opposed to, you know, because even in terms of what we're doing with the daylighting, you're going to find out that, you know, articulating every last window down to the last degree is not going to make the big difference in terms of what you're doing. It pretty much is going to be solid surfaces versus open surfaces that are letting light penetrate through them. And for a lot of what we're doing now, you know, simpler models will actually give you sort of a bit more control over what you're doing on the analysis side. Yeah, don't get lost in the complexity of your model. Okay, so another thing you can do with this is though, uh, if you already have a well-developed model, well actually no, let's keep on going with the masses. We'll sort of articulate a little bit over here and I'll show you what happens if you have a, already have a well-developed model, something you've already started created. Ready. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you bring a mass in from like CAD or SketchUp, yeah. do you do it the same way? Yes. Yeah. So again, just import it as SKP, okay, and then from there, or DWG. Yeah, either way. So here's the basic deal. I got these models kind of hanging around in here. Let me get rid of that one. These one two are actually sort of one big piece. Let me kind of, yeah, talk about that. Yeah, ta -ta -ta -ta. yeah I'll leave it there. Actually, I'll do it over in uh, Vasari first. Maybe that'll make more sense. Is Vasari still open? There it is. Okay. At some point, we're going to go ahead and move from just these basic surfaces to thinking about really what's happening on the surfaces. You know, where the solids are, where the voids are, all those sorts of things. And so for doing that, there's a couple ways we can approach it. One way is just in general. Yeah, let me finish that mass up. Okay. We can go ahead and take that mass. We'll say that we want to go to the Analyze tab. And we set up just sort of some overall parameters for, you know, if we were going to say uniformly across the whole building what the percentage of a solid surface is to a glazed surface, or ultimately we're going to think about it as more of an open surface, okay, we can set an overall percentage. And where that happens is actually under this thing called energy settings. Okay, and at a high level, and this is for the quick analysis, and you'll be doing something a little more detailed, but at a high level, we can just go ahead and say, hey, I just, as a general rule, want to have 40% glazing to the rest being solid, or 20% glazing, or something that's going to be appropriate for what your climate is. So when you want to do something like that, you say, turn on the energy model, you give it sort of an overall percentage, whether it's 20 or 30 or 40 or 55 or whatever you have in mind. Okay. You can go ahead and say, oh, what the target sill height is, and that'll sort of determine, as it's trying to just automatically place window openings, how high they should be off the ground. Okay. We can also do the same thing uh, to the roof. There's this whole thing about target skylights. 
So 0% be no skylights. If you want to have uniformly spaced skylights, yeah, over 10% of the roof or something like that, you can put something like that in there. Okay, and then it'll sort of say what the skylight width and depth is. If they're square skylights, how big should they be? Should it be one gigantic skylight or a smaller one? Yeah. Um, what we're going to end up doing, it's going to think of it as a glazed opening, and then when we get over to like Ecotest, we're going to tell it that it's an opening, it's just a void as opposed to being uh, glazed. Okay, so you can go ahead and just put in these really rough parameters and say, okay. And what's going to happen is it will uniformly, actually what you have to do is, oh, let me say enable the energy, energy model. We're going to have to do the first analysis. It's sort of interesting because I want to do that. Say okay there. I might have to go to the first step of saying analyzing the energy model. But I want to basically sort of see those sort of things. It might even be if I just turn off the energy model and turn it back on. Let me go ahead and get this thing going. You mentioned the other day that you could literally model your openings into it, right? Yep. Okay. And that's what we want to show you because that's where it really gets kind of groovy. So first level is just going ahead. Why do I always have trouble with that? Okay, let's try this. Oh, it's because I'm typing the wrong password, that's why. Yes. Well, actually, yeah, honestly, I'd have to go back and think about really the correct order of operations there. It might be the other way. I think you have to do en enable energy model first just to sort of get the option to even make energy save settings enabled. But it's, uh, I'm pretty sure that it is that yeah, we enable the energy model first, then we do energy settings. Yeah. And then... Which it would actually do, it looks like, for me, it's interesting. It looks like they would actually start creating it first. It looks like it's actually not doing it until I actually say run the first analysis. You can't go back, go back to say, show mass, and show mass surfaces again. Let's see if we'll do that. I'm just trying to sort of do some new things. Still not actually doing this. I think it's not actually until we analyze it. It's actually going to do it. Okay. But the idea is, it goes through, and this is sort of the real approximation kind of using those percentages and this is actually not a very good sort of a, actually let's talk about a couple of things you want to do within here because uh, to sort of make this a little bit better in terms of these energy settings we'll customize it in terms of these energy settings what it does by default is for thermal analysis it'll break things down into this notion of perimeter offset thermally what that's all about is we typically have rooms like this room which are maybe 15 feet wide which are controlled more by the outside surface before we get to a hallway, which is really well controlled by uh, some inside conditions. So that's what this is all about, the perimeter offset. For our buildings that are going to be open air, set that to zero. Okay, because that'll actually mean there's no perimeter offset, it'll just be considered one big zone, and then light will sort of percolate through the whole space. So I'm going to reset that to zero too, also. And I can even say not divide the perimeter zones. In fact, I think if I say zero, it'll turn off the perimeter zones because that'll make like a big clear space. So what's going to happen now is all the light in here is going to go all the way through. It's not going to get blocked by some interior wall. Okay, so this is at a really high level, just kind of how you can do it, just putting things in numerically and not really kind of controlling it very well. Now, but this level of control isn't really good. Great if you need a 10-minute analysis, but you're going to go a little bit deeper than that. So let's talk how you start getting a little finer. The deal is this. We got these guys. I'm going to shift, shift back to show the show mass zones. I'm going to go to mass surfaces. Okay. You can sort of see where the glazed surfaces or what will ultimately be open surfaces are versus the solid surfaces. What you want to do is for any of these surfaces, if you want to sort of change them and customize them, you can tab and see if you can actually get the surface. If you could hover right on the edge, oops, I got that one right there. Okay. I can then choose it and I can say, as opposed to using the default settings, go ahead and let me customize that just by this surface. So I can say, great, on that one surface, I only want to have 10% glazing. And on that one surface, maybe I'll put a shade on it that's uh, five feet deep. 
So you can start to, on a custom, like wall by wall basis, go ahead and start changing those things. But then we're going to go even further. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Okay, no worries. What happens is, after you've gone ahead, let me grab another one. I'll grab this front face over here. What I do is I sort of hover over an edge, and I do a little tabbing. I tab, 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 and it goes through different options. Right now it's looking at the side face. Now it's looking at the front face. I click on that front face, get it blue. And then over in the properties palette, and I keep mine exposed. Yours may, you might have to roll down. There's this thing where it says energy model, and I'm going to change it to by surface. That'll let me do the customization just on that one surface. So I'll say, great, that's going to be 80%. And it's going to have some shade on it that is, oh, 10 feet deep. Now, just one other sort of thing to clarify. Yes. You have, you created both those separate buildings as one mass. Yes. Because if you did it as two separate masses, you'd have to run two separate analysis on it, or? Actually, it's sort of interesting. This is a, for the energy model, Actually, I'm taking that back in terms of doing that. It, it uses the same settings across all of them. Oh, God, okay. Yep. okay. At least the high-level settings it uses across all of them. So if I wanted to go ahead and distinguish between the two, I would change like the, the settings for one versus the settings for the other by doing the customization. Right, the way you're doing it now. Yeah. Because right? yeah. some of them, I know from looking at my studio, some of you guys might have a complex of multiple buildings. So you, know, you can just do it all as one mass, no problem, and then you can customize it like that. Exactly. Okay. Okay, so oh, you're looking good over there. Okay, you got like sort of something yeah, interesting, a lot of different surfaces and customization. Okay, got it. Now, so we can go through and do it this way. The third chunk of it, though, is if you really want to find level control, is to say, hey, and as opposed to sort of like doing everything in this sort of just numerically driven way, can I really control exactly where the windows are? And you can. And how you do that is. Go ahead and choose the surface that you really want to do some custom control on. And I'm going to say, make the uh, target percentage on that just zero. Okay, make it a solid wall. Okay, because what's going to happen is, if you give it a numeric value and then you start customizing it, those two things are going to start conflicting with each other. So I'm going to say, give that a zero. Okay, make it a solid wall. Okay, but then in order to sort of put in the windows in the very specific locations, what you can do is as follows. Go ahead and choose that guy, and we're going to edit the mass again. Okay, so edit in place. So you can do that a couple of ways. You can take that mass and double click it. That'll open it up. Or you can uh, take that mass and say edit in place. Either way will work. And then with that in place, I always have to find it in here. I choose the surface, and you'll find this is the weirdest little icon. I don't know why it looks like this. It looks like a TV to me. But it's like a little, looks like, oh, well, because I'm old, and that's what TVs used to look like. <laughs> <laughs> with cathode ray tubes. Uh, but it, it's basically, it's called splitting the surface. And if you take that little guy, it gives us a tool where we can then go ahead and draw on the surface. Okay, some specific opening. And what's going to happen is that opening, the loop within the loop, will be interpreted as an opening in that uh, space. So if I say finish that, Okay, that'll be a window. Okay, so it's really, let me go do that again. So we'll come back over here. I'll take that, I'll edit in place. Let me, I'll go through and, well, I'll show you what happens if they sort of overlap a little bit. I'll choose this face over here. Here's the little um, edit split face or whatever it is. Split, I'm going to find what it's called. And now I can go through and put sort of something custom in there. whatever it is you have in mind. And then when you finish it, let me go back over here to, well, it's interesting. It looks like it that did it. Well, no, this is interesting. I confused it there. Because <laughs> now it has sort of like uh, the big opening. It also has the little percentages in there and it has that little guy over there. So. What I should do again is come back over here. That's it. That's it. There's a bug in that in terms of what's going on right there. And I think it's probably because of what I did over there. Okay, that's back to this, the, the percentages. 
you left the percentages, right? Which you told yeah. us not to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm confused about why that one actually, I'm, I'm actually confused about why those two are showing up there on the sides. Because that's, oh, no. I don't think those should be there. Because I think that what we did was we said zero. But it's still showing something there. Well, actually, now I take that back. Let's go back here again. Let me, uh, I'll choose that surface. Oh, it's by the energy settings. I want to do it by surface and set it to zero. Somehow that got reset. Okay, now we're back to normal again. Okay, so watch out for that because you get this weird interaction between the, the numer numerically driven and the, the manually placed. I want to go back to the editing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. You have to go back and split the face again. That should work, although it's interesting because I think about that. That's especially for adding new ones, but no, you're right. I think that's it. And then you get this that line. Very good. Yeah, they actually reactivate the tool to get back to yeah, that mode. It's the same way in the regular Revit interface. Yes. You're splitting like a face of the wall or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is it? So, so, okay. Try this first thing where you say analyze the model. What happens there? Let's see if it actually goes to that first step with you. And they probably ask you to sign in to get past that. Okay. Try that and let's see if it'll give you the, uh, that initial cut of the. <laughs> that, that's the next one. Yeah. Oh, no worries. We need to take step on that. Actually, hang on. You, you have trouble? No worries. Okay, so you start playing and customizing the faces and all that type of stuff. You get it all set up in here. This is kind of going to how you get started with the whole thing. This whole thing of really good. Okay. Yeah. This whole thing about creating the basic faces, this is how you get going in terms of customizing it here. If you needed to go through, or um, if you had created a Revit model already, a well-articulated Revit model that has a lot of pieces, you can go ahead, there's a couple of strategies you can use there. Either you can take that Revit model and sort of just trace a mass around it to kind of get the simple surfaces that way, or the way it'll work in, I'm gonna, we'll run out of time this morning, so I'll, I won't show you the detail that, but if anyone wants to stick around, I'm around all day, kind of, we can kind of like uh, do something with you. Because we have to 9.30, right? We do, uh, you know what, I'm gonna, I'll run around to something to, to see, maybe we, if there's not gonna be a third session, maybe we just need to Oh, if you can extend, that'd be fantastic if you could. Right, let me go, let me, let me check on that. Okay, let's do that. And Okay, no worries. Okay, if you um, so we're pretty good in terms of uh, thinking about getting the faces up this way. Beautiful. Okay, let's from this show you how you would export this, and I'll show you what you do if you have a real Merivet model already, and how you export that. Then we'll take them over to the daylighting. Here's basically the scoop. Okay, you got this thing. It's looking pretty good. It's sort of feeling okay enough in terms of what's going on, but it's enough to get us started with our daylighting analysis. We'll keep on adapting and adjusting it. When you are ready to take this over to start doing some daylighting analysis, okay, you can't always do the simple thing of just looking at the shadows in here, just by turning on the shadows. Okay, but we'll also go ahead and do that over in Ecotech, so you can do that. But just so you do know, there is a notion right here of there's like you can turn on the shadows and there's the sun path over here, and between those two different things, you can start pulling the sun around and starting to see generally where the shadows are going and get some preliminary feedback, even before you go over to the more detailed analysis. So again, there the shadows are turned on. If I go orbiting around, I might start to get a pretty good sense of really how far the LED daylight's penetrating into the building at this time of day. Hey. Oh, no worries. And I turned on the sun path. Here's the sun path. And so with the sun path, I can actually start playing around, moving the shadows through the day. Okay, or just moving it to a different time of the year, the summertime or the wintertime, whatever it is, where you'll have the longer or the shorter shadows. Actually, it's a pretty good demonstration of right there how short the shadows are when they're in the middle of the summer, okay, versus if I switch that back over from June till December, you'll see how long the shadows are. 
change just at the same time of day, just in the winter time instead. And that just has to do with you know, the, the height of the sun in the sky. Okay, so you can start doing a little bit of shadow analysis and just sort of start to get a sense. In fact, this is kind of interesting. Here we are in winter time. Just by virtue of where we are at noontime, you can see the sun in that big window. The sun's going almost all the way through the entire building. Okay, so we're actually getting some direct sunlight, you know, without even having to worry about the uh, reflection of the sunlight off the different things. Okay, but once you have the building in here and you're feeling pretty good, what you want to do is do an export. So we'll go ahead and export it as. And under the export choices, you go to something called a mass model GBXML. So go ahead and try that, see if you can find it. It's under export, mass model GBXML. And when you take it out as a mass model X GBXML, actually I should save my project. I'm very bad, I never save as we work and I should do that because that's a good habit and you should get in the habit of doing it. As you guys work, only try to you know, do as I do, or to say, not as I do. And that's like, only keep on going without saving to the point where you're willing to lose your work. <laughs> because beyond that, you know, you get yourself in trouble. So that's daylighting one. Okay, so that is just the basic uh, file. I save that. Let me go ahead and save the XML. I'm going to say NJIT daylighting one XML. We'll save that away. And what's that XML file? It's really just a big file that's describing that geometry. It's a bunch of XYZ Cartesian coordinates that just sort of describe what are those surfaces, and is it a solid surface, or is it a clear surface? That's all it really is. It's just a text file format, and it's very useful for transferring data around between a lot of different programs. Okay, that XML file can be read by Green Building Studio. We'll go ahead and kind of take a look at it in just a second there, but let me kind of show you before we go over there, just the other side of this, which is just, oh, if we're in Revit, let's see if I can get to Revit, close some of these things up. What happens if you already have a model that's you know somewhat developed and you want to go ahead and take that one out? So here's the deal. As opposed to doing mass modeling, oh, let's say you've already gotten started. You have walls, doors, and windows. You have some things that you already sort of set up with a building and you want to get going. And just uh, for the sake of kind of doing something quickly, I'll just build a little something. Okay, within that, I'll go through and put some windows in. I'm going to go through and, oh, let me go to 3D view. pretty ugly little building. <laughs> but I will go through and put a little curtain wall on a section of it. What I'm going to do is just, uh, I'll do a little modify. Let me just split this wall a little bit. And I'll take that little section right there and make it into a curtain wall, just so I can have some place where a lot of light is flooding in there. Um, we need to put a floor and put a roof on this thing. Okay, so I'll go through and put a floor under it. I'll pick some walls, I'll pick around all those walls. Actually, maybe you won't let me do that. Let me trim those last two. Curtain walls are always a little bit funny in terms of how the walls line up. Let me finish that up. That's a floor underneath it. I need to put a roof on the top of it now because I just need to sort of get a little enclosed space for this to work. For the roof, I'll put it at level two. That's fine. Again, if you're not familiar with Revit as much, not to worry. This is just enough to kind of get us started. What I'm going to do is do a little trimming here. Even for these things, let me put a little overhang on this roof because, yeah, generally I'll put like a two foot overhang on it. We usually have a little protection from the sun and the rain. And I'm going to basically turn off the sloping on these three sides. And again, if that all went by too fast, not to worry. You won't need it necessarily for what we're doing. Okay. So I got a basic little surface kind of hanging around, or building hanging around in here. If you have something like this, which is already articulated, and this is not very well articulated, but it'll be enough to get us started, and we want to go through and transfer that over as an XML file, a couple things. Again, we can sort of try to shrink wrap it with a mass, and that'll work if you have a very well you know, developed building, and that's the simplest way. But the way it was originally designed to work is as follows. You can go through and take a room, a room element, and make a room out of that. 
And if you put a room in, what rooms do is they're very good at basically saying, hey, let me go to all the walls and go to all the doors and to the floor and to the roof and just try to fill all that space. And it turns out the boundaries of the room are a pretty good approximation for that shrink wrap space. So that's how they basically got this started. We just put a room in there, and when we put a room in there, a couple things we need to know, just in terms of working with it, to kind of make it work just right. One is rooms by default start at zero and go up to like 10 feet. Okay, and that works very well for a lot of rooms. Often within 10 feet, you'll find a ceiling or you'll find a roof. For a big, clear story sloping roof, though, you may not find it. Okay, so what we tend to need to do for these tall spaces is actually, there's this thing called the limit offset. And we're just gonna like pop that up a little bit higher so that it's gonna catch the full sloping space. So let me show you what I mean. I'll go through and cut a section to this thing and show you how it works. So here I am, I'm looking at my building. That's okay, there's the room right there. Let me even make that visible so you can sort of see it. Oh, where is it, the room fill. Okay, that's the room by default, that little blue area that's only going up 10 feet. The problem is it's not catching my roof. What I need to do is actually say, hey, go ahead and extend that up. Let's go ahead and make that 30 feet tall or 40 feet tall. Really just as tall as it would be, need to be to be sure to catch the top. Okay, so far so good, but it hasn't actually sort of caught the top yet. It's sort of uh, just going the entire distance. And the final thing we need to do in Revit to kind of make it sort of work right for what we do to export it as XML is there's this thing where we say area and volume calculations, where we turn on the volumes. Here's the deal. By default, what happens in Revit to saves time only computes the area of rooms. It doesn't bother to actually go ahead and find where the ceiling is because it takes more time. So for the purpose of what we're doing, we want it to do that. So we turn that on, okay? And now that's actually a well-bounded room, okay? It does what it needs to. Yeah, where did you look? Okay, different, yeah, hiding for you, right? Okay, <laughs> what is under the home tab, under room and area, okay, way down in there, there's area and volume computations. Okay, off by default, you turn on volumes and then it'll catch the roof properly because it'll bother to consider the Z direction also. So Actually, I push this till till ten. We'll do oh, fantastic! Two sections, so this can go till ten, and then the second section will go ten to eleven. Period. We'll have a few more people in the second. Oh, section. fantastic! Oh, thank you. That's Probably great. We have more detail. I think it's better for them to get into more detail. Today. Fantastic. That's good. And for all this stuff, actually, I'll point you to some videos and stuff that really summarize all this stuff. Because I have a lot of like stuff recorded that really you know, goes through the detail of how you set up the GBXML and get it ready for export. So not to worry if something, some of this flies by a little fast. There's plenty of stuff to kind of get you going again. Okay, so once you got that basic thing going, great, you're ready to go ahead and export the GBXML. It's going to do pretty much the same thing we did out of Asari. And when you want to export GBXML of your main Revit model, we'll say export GBXML, as opposed to mass model GBXML, it's just GBXML, because it's going to do it out of the real surfaces. It'll create something that, in some ways, that'll look pretty similar. That's sort of like the mass volume in there. Interesting things to know about this, though, that's kind of cool. Okay. There's things up here like office, the type of building, whether it's an office or residence, a hotel, or whatever it is. Okay. That has to do more with the energy analysis in terms of figuring out, is it a you know, 24 by 7 building, is it a you know, 8 by 5 building, really how often is it used, what the usage pattern is. Location, that will go ahead and set. That's actually something we need to get all the daylighting values right for this time of Ground plane determines if it's a building that has some underground surfaces versus an overground surface, what they consider to be the level of the ground. Um, sliver space tolerance, don't worry about that too much. That is often between, oh, in buildings will have these gaps between rooms, and it's really how big a gap can be before you actually start to consider it to be a real space that's between things. Like in most buildings, you'll have between the walls like six inches or so of just space that we don't really want to consider to be a separate room. It's just dead space between the walls. Consider that to be a continuous surface. That's what that's all about. And how big can that space be before it becomes a separate room? And export complexity, let's talk about that. So that's the one that gets sort of interesting. Under that one, there is simple. Simple does this. I'm going to even pull down the choices here. Simple says, let's go ahead and take the entire building, okay? but we're going to ignore the shading surfaces. We're going to ignore the fact that this roof overhangs. We're just going to take the volume and build it. If you include the shading surfaces, 
it will include those overhangs and any sun shades and bring those across. So for what you're doing, you definitely want to make sure you include the shading surfaces because that's a big part of what your design's about. Complex has to do with the notion of for this big plate glass window here, this gigantic curtain wall, do you want to think of that as being one gigantic piece of glass? Or if you make it complex, it will actually start thinking of those as being separate pieces of glass. Okay, that you can then start changing the properties of. Okay. Shading surfaces with complex, that will go ahead and include the shading surfaces. Mullions will actually start to include the effect of all the different mullion pieces too. And you're going to find that when we really start doing some interesting surface stuff, that's a really good thing to do because a lot of what we do now in terms of trying to come up with interesting shading systems, we actually sort of build into the mullions, either horizontal, like uh, shells or vertical fins. There's a lot of really things we can do just right in the model you know, as part of the window system. Okay, so we can look at some of that stuff too. But go ahead and take the model out. We will say next to this, I'm going to say simple with the shading surfaces. Give it a name. Let me put that in my uh, documents also. And I will go ahead and call that, that's going to be MGIT Daylighting 1B XML. Okay, that's it. So either way, if you have a well-articulated model or a preliminary model, you got to get it out to one of these XML files because that's really the beginning of a simple surface model. You can go ahead and use a Renicotect. So let's pause there for a second, just before we go diving into Ecotech and kind of answer questions about some of that stuff. So as you're looking at it, how, how's that sort of feeling relative to what you have to do? You sort of have a sense of how to like uh, you know, kind of build something like that that has your basic surfaces and maybe cut the, the big openings where they need to be. Yes. Is there a way to change to make it? Yes. Actually, we didn't have, That's just a project units thing. So yeah. somewhere in there, oh, go under manage, yeah. and somewhere in there we're going to find like project settings, try additional settings. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So the question was about whether or not we can change the units. And the answer is yes, under manage, we'll say project units, and then we can change really whether we want to be using the metric or the imperial system. And the good news is, if you've already modeled something one way or the other, just flip the units over, and you can go back and forth. In fact, what a lot of people will do, even if you're working in an imperial system, you can type in dimensions as 3.0 meters, and it will do all the conversions on the fly for you. So no worries in terms of, yeah, it's, it's good about that. If you yeah, work in the system that's familiar to you. So I got my basic message there. Okay, let me go ahead and I'm going to kind of just put those away. I'm going to open up Ecotect. Because Ecotect is where we're going to go with this. So Ecotect is really the granddaddy of all these sort of analysis tools. It's the most full-featured and really a lot of what you see now in Vasari came out of Ecotect. It's really that was just in a way to kind of make the Ecotect features more you know, connected so you didn't have to do this external export. But when you really want to get down to the hardcore answers, Ecotech is where to go. So in Ecotech, a couple things to do. One thing we want to do over here is basically just set it up so that it looks the way you want it to be. So under user preferences here, again, there's that issue about the localization. So choose whether you want to be SI units or Imperial units because that'll start to affect you know, both the lengths, but also even in terms of daylighting values. Like as you guys are working at, are you guys thinking about it in terms of foot candles? You're thinking in terms of lux, or how do you? I don't think we thought about it at all. Okay. Uh, and, <laughs> honestly. No worries. Um, I know we're working in, term, in uh, the metric system because it's a project in India, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, there is a corporate sponsor for the project. Uh -huh. We're gonna come over and look at all the stuff for, for the final project. And so working in the metric system is pretty much essential. Now whether nice. people think metrically or not and work back and forth, there's sort of a difference. I think whatever we want to do the calculations in, it doesn't really matter. So Super. Because in the same sense, it'll go back and forth. Then I'll stay with the US system just only because I know the foot candle value is more in my brain that way, as I was thinking. It's really weird about what you can't. Length I'm very good at. Temperature, I, you can tell me it's 26 degrees and I have no idea like how warm that is or something like that because it's, it's sort of what you were raised with. You know, it's like, it's, it's kind of weird about what your, your brain can do and can't do. Okay, so I'll say with like feet and inches for now, that's fine. I'll say just, uh, that's fine. It's under file and then user preferences. Okay, no worries. 
Now, okay, first thing we're going to do is bring in our model so we can go ahead and do some analysis on it. So for that, let's go ahead and do this. I'll say file, and we're going to do a little import. And under the file import, what we're going to do is model analysis data. So see if you, if you saved away a GBXML file to work with, let's go ahead and see if you can bring yours in. Say file, import, model, and analysis data. And then the key is to go out and find it. Now to find it though, you might have to change this. It typically goes to an MOD file, which you won't have. You want it to be an XML file. And then we have to go off looking for it. And I put mine as line in my documents folder. But you can think about where you put yours. Daylighting one, that's my one. Let's bring it across. It'll show us that there are a couple of different masses in here. That's because I think I had three different buildings on my site. Okay, and there's all the different faces. And if you want to actually look at the XML node structure, you can. This is actually what the file looks like. I'm, it's hard to sort of decode into anything. But what I'm going to say is just open it as a new file. And you'll see, you should get something that looks like that. Okay, just something like that. That's just, again, sort of a surface model. Kind of coming across. Oh, great. You're looking good. So just see if you can kind of bring across whatever it is. Looking good. What's going to happen is the relatively odd. Now, did that actually, did that come out of, uh, that came out of Ecotech 2? Or, uh, sorry, to yeah. yours. It's, it's doing some different things. If the surfaces are sort of relatively square, it'll kind of go ahead and keep them as single surfaces. If the curved surfaces are things that are sort of torqued a little bit, it'll go through and triangulate them into sort of different surfaces as best it can. Okay. But what you're looking at here is like solid and kind of void surfaces. Actually, we're going to change those in just a second. This is just sort of the line model of it. In this tool, there's other things you can do. It might be helpful. This is the 3D editor view where we can sort of, sort of mess with all the lines. If you switch to the visualization tab, that might give you a better sense of what's going on. So that'll actually sort of show you a little bit. And I'll warn you, there are some little graphical goobers in this. The fact that this sort of roof looks like it's transparent right now, I'm not going to worry about that just yet. We'll take a look at its properties and see if it really is transparent. But there definitely are little graphical things where it doesn't always display it right, but it'll do the analysis right on it. I'll show you that in a second. But we sort of see some surfaces. We sort of see some things that look like clear surfaces. The holes in the walls. Yeah, it's kind of what we tried to bring across. So how are we doing in terms of bringing stuff? We got some stuff that looks pretty good. I see some shading surfaces. That looks good. You're looking fine there. Don't worry about looking clear just yet. OK. We're looking pretty good. Oh, wow. That's actually kind of groovy with all the skylights. That actually looks really nice. <laughs> OK. So here's basically what we need to do over here. There's a couple things. One thing we should do is we should set up your latitude and longitude. And the other thing we should go ahead is uh, set your orientation. Those are both going to be important to us in terms of what's happening on the daylighting. You know, for the latitude and the longitude, a couple ways you can do that. You can sort of put them in manually. If you know what they are, you can put them in manually. Or what I tend to do is I load a climate file that has those built into it, and it's usually pretty close to what I want. Okay, and but either way, whatever's going to work for you. And if you want to load in the latitude and longitude, it's right up in here, way up in the upper right hand corner. It says climate. Let's see if I can get to this. Let me pull down under this. I'm going to load a weather file. And what I'm going to go to, they actually have one for Delhi. So let me go for that one, see if I can find it. India, New Delhi right there. But we can go ahead and again adapt that to be closer. To, in fact, you know, we can find detailed weather files from weather stations all over the world and kind of bring them in too. If you actually oh, were the carrying same format. Yep. Oh, okay. So let's bring that in there. What it's going to do is going to ask me, do I want to update the position? I say sure. Okay. So what that's going to do is update the latitude and longitude there. Okay, but we can go ahead and set that manually. Got to find where that is. Okay, so what's one thing to do is do that. Another thing we want to do is to start to think about really how the project is oriented on the site. That's under the model, and let me find it in here, site and location. Okay, here's again latitude and longitude, the time zone. This is this notion of is there an offset from north? Because what's happening over here, if I go back over to visualize, oh, if I kind of rotate this around, okay, yeah. And the way it sort of thinks of it, north is at the top of the screen right now, south is down here, east and west. We can need to sort of torque that a little bit, so I kind of give a different orientation so that you're more accurate on the site. 
Yeah, it won't change the positioning of the grid. It will change the positioning of the sun when it's casting shadows, though. Okay, what you do is again under model, site and location, and I can go ahead and put in some offset there, kind of show north is actually at this position relative to the grid right now. Okay, again, won't change the appearance here, but it will change what's happening with the sun. Okay, let's go ahead. I'm going to flip that back over again to the perspective view. Now, all these different surfaces, this is where it gets sort of interesting about what's clear and what's not clear and all those different things. Because what's happening for daylighting, for the most part, the fact that something is just sort of solid versus clear is probably pretty good enough to get you going. But let's go ahead and take a look at some of these surfaces and see how this works. If I choose, for example, that one right there, Okay, and choosing things in Ecotech is a little bit challenging, so let's talk about that. Okay. If you come on over and grab a surface like that, and it grabs the wrong surface, it's going to sound weird. In Revit, you tab to get other surfaces and kind of rotate through the options. In Ecotech, and I hate this, you space to rotate through the different options. Okay. Again, different programs came from different sources. They implemented totally different schemes, and it never got unified. But so, if you're having trouble sort of selecting something, see if you can get right on the edge. If not, get on the edge and then space on, and see if it'll rotate through the different options. So, one thing we we'll want to do is it's going to bring in all those things that we thought of as windows, as single glazed windows, something like that. Okay, that's kind of okay. But if you really want them to be voids, if you want them to just be open air surfaces and have, not have any sort of uh, reduction through uh, like uh, the daylighting, what you do is go ahead and choose that. What's going to happen? You can see over here in a little side browser. We can see a little information about the object. Let me see if I can pull that sideways so you can see a little more of it. It's currently set up as a single glazed timber frame window. Okay, Kind of a quaint way of saying it, but a wood frame uh, window, single glazing. Okay, What I can do is pull down a menu here, and I can either sort of select the material for that one thing, or I can actually, and here's where it gets useful, select the matching objects. And when you do that, what it's actually going to do is go through and select every object in that model that is currently thought of as a window. Okay. And that may be a useful thing for you because if you want to go ahead and change all those windows into voids, okay, that's the quickest way to do it. Go ahead and grab one, choose it, and then as its type, say, you know, you're not really a window, you're just a void. Voids have a different set of properties, but now it's a void. Hopefully that one's a void. Hopefully that one's a void. Okay, so what's going to happen now? It's not going to work very well thermally, but it's going to work just fine in terms of making sure the windows have uh, no resistance. You yeah. could go ahead and just sort of adjust the properties of the glazing to make it you know, ultra clear and not block this, that, and the other. But void is probably the easiest way to do it in terms of really making sure that we don't have any negative effects and any well, reflection. The buildings are going to have, I mean, it's only going to be one, one of the buildings is going to be enclosed, not an exhibition space, right? But the rest of them, where it's supposed to be designed open air. Mm -hmm. So the, therm the thermal performance ultimately will, you know, will not be great, but it'll, all, it'll provide lots of ventilation. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, so that's the thing about trying to, if you go from glazed surfaces to voids, just got to go through and change them there. And again, if anything happened wrong, for example, on, as I was visualizing here, see how that surface, it looks like it's kind of clear on the top, but I'm not really 100% certain about it. Let me see if I can choose it. I'll tab to choose my roof there. Now, it does think that it's a ceiling of some sort of metal deck, even though it's not visualizing well. It's, it's going to go ahead and do the right thing for sunlighting. Now, just to sort of test this in terms of what's going on, what you can do is, let me go back to visualize, I'll bring that up again, and turn on the sun. You can start to see a little bit about where the sun is coming and not coming. Let me go ahead and actually, it's not accurate at first. I need to actually sort of, this is kind of weird, you need to sort of goose it a little. Okay, in terms of what's happening there, hang on. I'm going to bring that back over here. Let me display the shadows. What you can do is actually go through also and display the sun path. 
that gives you back to the heliodon in terms of what's going on. So this is very much like what you're looking at, like inside of a Revit or inside of a Sari or Ecotect. It's just basically the idea of moving and sort of seeing what's happening with the sun. And we can play games with the shadows kind of throughout the day and sort of start looking at shadow studies. We can go through and do all sorts of animations or look at things within different ranges. For example, oh, if I want to see like an hourly kind of analysis of what's going on in the sun, you can go do something like that and save it as a movie. Okay. You could also do this thing where you say annually what happens to the sun. And the idea there is, if we're sort of thinking about just as we move from uh, December through June, really what happens to the sun, you start seeing where the short shadows are and where the long shadows are. So that's enough to kind of get started with the sun. Just so you know what's going on with the helion, heliodon, what you're seeing down there in uh, the bottom is this is the sort of notion of it's the heating months and the cooling months. So it's basically just showing you sort of the range of like really where the shadows are falling kind of between the hot months or the summer months and the, the winter months. So it's just kind of giving you the range. That's what the red and the blue is down there. What else do we need to know about this? That's enough to kind of get you going with that just in terms of the sun cap because we're less concerned about sort of the shadows. We'll talk about the shadows, but we want to start thinking about really the daylighting inside that building. So let's go ahead and look at that. Now, there's two sorts of things you may want to do. One is sort of this numerical analysis. The other is thinking about the sun rays. Let me do the numerical stuff because that's actually pretty quick to do. And what we'll do is we'll take a look at, for example, this building back here. I'll go back to the 3D editor just so I can sort of see it a little bit better. What I want to do here, and oh, I always have trouble navigating around in here. Let me pan on down. Every tool has its own separate suite of like uh, navigation tools. Let me just turn off those shadows so I'm not looking at them right now because it'll make it a little bit clearer. Okay. As you're doing sunlighting analysis, here's the basic deal. You want to go ahead and it's really best to start thinking about the individual spaces. Like I could do a shadow analysis across the, or sunlighting analysis, daylighting analysis across the entire site. The problem with doing that is the values are going to be so intense in the places where there's direct sunlight that you won't see the subtlety of what's happening inside your building. Okay. So it's actually better to start thinking about doing subsets at a time, so places where you'll actually see a range of values between near the windows versus inside, and sort of not be considering the outside surfaces right off. So for example, if this is one of my halls right here and I want to start thinking about what's happening with the sun in there, actually it's going to be very bright, I can tell you that already. Just because I have so much going on, I might need to do something to mitigate that sun. But here's how you do it. Go ahead and choose one of your buildings, doesn't matter which one it is, and if you can, get back to that 3D editor view, because what I want you to do is basically select one of the floor surfaces. See if you can grab one of the floors. Okay, because what we're going to do is we're going to put a grid on that floor, a grid that'll allow us to measure really what the daylighting level is that's hitting in there. So if I choose that floor and over here in all the different tools, switch down to the one that looks like a little blue kind of folded grid. Okay, we're going to go through and basically put a grid in place there. Now, it's not the best organized dialogue in the world, but the one you want to sort of find is auto fit grid to objects. And what I'm going to say is, I want to put a grid within that space. Now, in terms of that grid, it's going to put it in the XY plane, that's good. It's also going to put it at a height. Here's what we do. When we're doing daylighting analysis, we don't actually think about what the daylighting is hitting the floor. What we tend to do is think about what is the daylighting hitting right at the desk level, or at a good reasonable work level. And that's why it's choosing, it's 1 foot 11 and 5 eighths. It's right around 2 feet. There's a standard for where that's measured. And it's based on daylighting up here, not down at the floor level. So it's going to actually put the grid a little bit off the ground. But if you put a grid in, you should hopefully get something that looks like that. So see if you can get some sort of grid in your space. And don't worry about if it's like a kind of not quite even around the edges. It's going to go through and make a rectangular grid. If your building is curving, you may have like a jagged sawtooth around the edge. That's okay. You're still going to get the message about what's going on. You know, you know, where it is, you know, one inch away from the window, it's just sort of, you know, any the overall sense. So, get yourself a grid in there. I'm looking at some good looking grids. You now want to go through and just basically turn on the analysis. And to do that, scroll way down to the bottom of this thing on the right hand side. We can do things like compute the lighting level, compute the insulation level. We're going to do lighting levels. 
and I'll say perform calculation. So there's a whole dialogue here that really walks you through a lot of different choices. Let me just kind of give them to you quickly. We can start with natural light levels versus daylighting and electric light levels, because we're just going to think about the natural sunlight for now. Next, do it over the entire analysis grid, and I'll say yes to that. Next is sort of the level of precision you need for the ray tracing, and I'd leave it to the default. You don't really need ultra precise for what you're doing at this point. It'll just slow things down on you. Okay, next is the whole idea of the design sky illuminance. Let's talk about that. In order to do this, okay, it turns out daylighting is a funny thing. It's not really dependent on sort of the, uh, what would I say? It's, it's different than sunlighting. Daylighting, in order to sort of evaluate things fairly, okay, really is done with the idea that there's a certain amount of brightness to the sky that is really coming into the building from all sides. Okay, so it's not just from the southeast or the north. It, has, it really comes from all sides. And the reason they do this is when you're evaluating buildings for daylighting, we really don't want it to be orientation specific in terms of what's going on. We also don't want you to be able to sort of say do, it's also, it's uniform throughout the year. We don't want you to be able to like go ahead and evaluate your building on June 21st, right at noon, when it probably has the best daylighting it'll ever have, as opposed to in the middle of December. So it's all done as averages, and kind of a normalized value. So there's sort of just a uniform ball of light in the sky that comes in from all sides. And this is really how it's determined. Okay, with the lightnesses. There's the idea what the window cleanliness is. I'm actually going to put it in completely clean because we don't have windows. The idea is most people have schmutzy windows that are not quite 100%. So you can go ahead and diminish the daylighting for that. I'll say regulatory compliance mode. That's all good. Let me just say okay and we'll accept these settings. It's going to go off and start doing some calculating. And what it's doing is it's digitizing that space. And it's figuring out for all the different cells in that space how much light's coming in and bouncing off all the surfaces and ultimately hitting all those different surfaces. And when it gets all done, it's going to give us a big color map that's going to really display how much daylighting is coming in there. So even though you only put the grid on the floor level, it still knows to calculate everything from all the other surfaces. Right? Exactly. Okay. It's going to consider all the surfaces. It's only going to measure it there. But in right. terms okay. of the, all the bouncing and the ray tracing, it'll consider everything. Okay. So as this goes through, it's going to go through and give us the color grade. Don't worry about it. We'll rescale the color grade in a second in terms of what's going on. And it's all done. But oh, what do we need to know about what's going on at this level? Oh. As you're thinking about daylighting and things that are coming in, the big things that are really affected more than anything are, is if you start thinking about all the different surfaces where light can bounce off, there's this whole notion of how reflective the surface is and how bright the surface is. So even things like color affect things an awful lot. And when we start playing around, we can start playing around not only with the geometry of what's going on in here, we can even start messing around with, it's really the reflectivity of the floor surface and the wall surface and the ceiling surfaces, because you'll find out that having very bright light surfaces reflects an awful lot of light and brings light back into the space. Having dark spaces really like uh, cuts the light that actually bounces around. So you can do a fantastic daylighting analysis with all sorts of things designed on a very light floor. When someone comes in there and puts in the really dark gray carpeting, like it actually it may be nice architecturally, but it starts cutting down on the daylight and really does have an impact on that. So you know a lot of it really does have to do with reflectances, even. If I painted this room incredibly bright ultralight, we'd have a sense of more daylight in this room as opposed to kind of this medium gray color that's in here now. So it's a lot of things you can do to sort of start playing around with daylight and reflect it. And hopefully it's going to start giving me a sense of what that is. Because for any of these surfaces, we can play with the color and we can play with the reflectivity and figure out what's going on. It's just about done here. Now my building is going to have way too much daylight in there. I can tell you already. It has very much because I have these gigantic 20 foot tall windows on all sides. It might as well just be outside. So that matter can come back. But we'll think about how to moderate that. Oh, we'll see a little bit of difference there. Okay, let's take a look at this. What's going on is as follows. Let me kind of push this on down a little bit. Zoom on in. The color scale that you're seeing is currently going, showing anywhere from like 16 to 58%. What you're seeing over here is right here around the edges, this is measuring right now, it's called the daylighting factor. So around the edges, this 
cell light over here is about 50% of what the full daylighting is sitting at the outside. So it's almost in full daylight. Okay. Back in here, in the core of the building, we're, always, we're still about 30% or something like that. We're not really very dark. The only place this building is dark right now is where this little L is sitting out. Okay. And right back in here, it's down to like 20 or 18%. But this is really an incredibly bright building because it has a big opening on all sides. I should have done a better job of modeling something that has a little less brightness to it in terms of what's going on. Okay, but it's giving us some value. These are daylighting factors. That's a percentage of full sunlight. Another way to look at this, though, that may be helpful for you is to switch it over to something called a daylighting level. Okay, and oh, let me show the node values so you can sort of see what the actual values are. And I'm only going to go, I'll put contours lines on and only show the peaks, which is, those are three different little things. Let me kind of do that again. Show the nodes is actually show the data values. I tend to only like to show the peaks, show me the high points. And then contour lines just give me the ability to kind of, as opposed to looking at the grid, kind of see where it is, kind of, oh, just really where the real the boundary lines are. Here's the way to think about daylighting levels. Okay. You find all sorts of guidelines about the amount of daylighting that's required in different spaces. Working through a hallway or just kind of doing something we don't have to do in the intense work, something like on the order of 40, 50 foot candles is just fine. That's kind of a general amount of illumination. But when we start getting into like rooms where you want to start having work surfaces and be able to work on paper or do anything with any detail, you're going to find all sorts of guidelines that want somewhere around 100 foot candles, something like that. But what happens is if it gets much brighter than that, it actually starts to get to be a little bit too glary and a little bit too bright. Okay, so you're going to find guidelines, and there's well-published tables that talk about the number of foot candles you need to work in the individual spaces. And you're going to find it's actually it's age-specific. When you get older like I am, you actually need to have a little bit more sunlight and a little bright, more brighter uh, light to actually be able to kind of read things through. But if things get too bright, then you actually can't see things. It gets to be a little bit uncomfortable. So honestly, this space the way I've designed it right now, I'd almost say is too bright. Because it's got like 200 foot candles in the middle of it. Now, you're going to look, feel like you're hot and sweating all the time in this case, so we need to actually kind of cut out some of the light in terms of what's going on. You know, this uh, map that's available, you can actually sort of like uh, do all sorts of things within here. For example, oh, if you want to go through and understand it in more detail, we can do things like change the contouring. I can change the contouring to well, like every 10. It'll show me a lot more contours. You can sort of say that you only want to show a minimum and a maximum. So only show me the areas that, for example, are over 200. Okay. And then I could even do something where I say clip to the minimum. Let's see if I can get that right. Okay. So that'll only show me the areas that are above 200. Or I can say, you know, this is a bad number. Show me only things that are above 300. It'll show me those are the areas that are really, really hot right now. So you can use this as an analysis, as a visualization tool to really find either the really dark areas or the really bright areas and try and figure out what's going on. Okay, so the analysis grid will get you going. Okay, let me just give you the other one real quickly in terms of the bouncing of the sun lighting so you can sort of see what's happening there. And then like, uh, we'll get you going. So I'll turn off my data analysis now. And let's look at the other way, which is just sort of the issue of sun rays bouncing around. Here's the deal. I got my sun. Oh, okay. I got that. I got my building over here. What I would like to do is actually think about like sun hitting these surfaces and really how sunlight bounces around. Okay. So if I want to start thinking about how shade or sun rays actually hitting things, what I can do, let me go through and choose some surfaces. I go to my 3D editor. I'll say, I want to think about how sunlight is hitting, for example, that space down there. What I can do is, under the sun tool, I may do something called, oh, basically uh, tag the selected object as a reflector. What does that do? That basically says, I want to see the sun rays that are hitting that thing and really what happens to them, like once they actually do go through and hit. So when I say show solar rays, looking a little intense. It's a little bit much in terms of what's going on there. Let me space them out a little bit broader. 
and they say only push them every two feet or something like that. Okay, let me orbit this around a little bit so you get a better sense of what's going on. Uh, okay. Okay, here's the sun that's actually hitting that floor right now. Okay, through the various sources that are coming through. And what happens is, if we go through looking at this, and we think about the heliodon that's kind of happening out here, okay, it's sensitive to what's going on here as I go moving through the sun through the sky. You'll see where the sun shades are hitting and where they're going are kind of uh, affected by that. And let me even stop and kind of pause and think about what's going on here a little bit. What's happening here, it may be a little hard to see because of the density is, we got a lot of sun that's hitting the roof right now. All that sun was targeted for the floor. A lot of it is coming in through the big old window back over there. That's what's happening here. There's little ones percolating through here. Do you know what that is? Can you guess what that is? It's all those little skylights. That's the skylight light coming in and doing its thing. There they're hitting the floor. If we say go ahead and increase it to two bounces, you'll start to see what actually happens in terms of the skylight light coming down, hitting the floor, and bouncing back up against the wall, or bouncing up here and hitting the ceiling. If you hit it to three bounces, which is about as far as you ever want to think about it, because beyond that, it's kind of uh, just gets very diffuse. Okay, and let me again, I'll spread that out a little bit further so it's not quite so dense. You start to see that for April 1st, here's what's happening. A lot of skylight, it's coming back in here. April 1st, yeah, no problem. You're looking very, very good in terms of what's going on over here. And the numbers that you showed us before, that reflects this bouncing yes. behavior? It does. Yes. Okay. If I switch that over to June, You'll see we get something a little bit different. Here, the sun's up much higher in the sky, so it's coming on down. Here's sort of this funny thing, though, that you have to watch out for. When you come on down, it comes to the skylight, it bounces back up. There's this whole notion of an incident angle and how light bounces. And what happens here is because we have this actual sloping surface, you actually sort of have a damping effect where it comes up and the light actually gets trapped a little bit. So you're going to find that what people do as they start designing is besides thinking about sort of the surfaces and shades and how it can bounce light off the shelves in these spaces, and even doing things on the ceiling, having little floating panels, ceiling panels, and baffles that actually have light coming up and reflected back into the space, that's a very effective strategy for kind of spreading out the light more evenly so it actually does reflect back in the face. The key thing to remember of daylight is you have to get the light in, but then you have to reflect it back in. It won't get back there all by itself. You have to reflect back in it. So you have to give it reflecting surfaces, like white painted surfaces and shiny surfaces, to get it back in there. But this will just start to give you a little sense of what's going on with all that, just so you can like uh, start to kind of really predict what's going to happen. Here you have sort of that December condition. Yeah. Coming down, coming up, coming up, but really... Although, yeah, a light's coming in over here, the back end is actually kind of dead in terms of the sunlight. It's like, uh, it's not reflecting back in where we want it to. But, yeah, sorry for rushing through that so quickly, but hopefully it'll give you a little sense. The key to doing this is bring your surface strip model in, that's fine, and then anything that you want to think about in terms of how the daylighting is hitting it, you know, make that a reflector. And as soon as you make it a reflector, it'll show you all the sun rays that were targeted for that and really either what's stopping them or how the light's bouncing off those reflective surfaces. Okay, so the floor is a good one to do. If you put any light shelves or shades on the outside, make those reflectors too. Awesome. Okay. Hopefully that's enough to get you started. Yes. If you guys can have some questions, I'm going to go round up the rest of the second group. If you have some questions, go back. You mentioned some uh, videos and tutorials. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. For these things, what you want to do is... Let's see if I can get out to Chrome. And I need to put this together for you just in... Okay. Let's uh, go to BIM Curriculum. Okay, 
If you want kind of a quickie overview of some of this stuff, there's a site called bimcurriculum.autodesk.com. It's really where we took a lot of the stuff I do in class and just sort of tried to reduce it down to you know, these little four and five minute videos. So there's a start of all this stuff in here just in terms of there's a daylighting section on the BIM curriculum. It's under green building design, so it's unit three, lesson five. And it, it talks about just setting up, you know, actually as you go through these things, even with passive design, it'll talk about how you set up a GBXML file to kind of do the export in Revit, walk you through how you sort of play around with the materials, think about it thermally, and daylighting will take you through the daylighting grid. So this is your kind of key area on the BIM curriculum. Okay, another place for you though that you want to know about is this site. It's called BIMtopia.com. BIMtopia is actually my own little blog site, and that's where I post all the stuff that I do in classes. So ultimately these workshops will end up in there too. So, in fact, we're going to we'll have this one recorded, and like, uh, so you can kind of play this back at any time. But floating around in here, and oh, I hate this because it's on the PC. It looks really bad. Yeah, that thing, uh, my little Google plugin, or my uh, let's pop back out there. Okay, under here, oh, I got to find it there. Jeez, I got to find one that's actually clean. Okay. Still not very clean. If you go on down there into workshops, Stanford University, there's like these are the classes from last fall that we were kind of working with in terms of doing uh, just uh, doing these things. Session 17: Structural and Build now it's, yeah Building Performance Analysis, and then uh, and here's Session 18: Building Performance and Model Based Estimating. Those are the two that are really uh, going to be probably the most relevant in terms of setting up the GBXML files and starting with the daylighting analysis and taking it across. Okay, so yeah, just a lot of videos out there. The BIM workshop is the uh, five to 10 minute condensation. These ones that are out here, like session 17 or something like that, that's, that's me just kind of doing like what we did here in terms of actually walking through class and stuff like that. So using Green Building Studio to explore alternatives. Yeah, that's the beginning of it in terms of the GBXML. So go ahead and like, uh, yeah, take a look at some of those too. Okay, so for that I get started. We'll go ahead and like, uh, I'll send something out that I can send out that has links to those things. Well, thank you. No worries.